Hey everyone, we did it. We made it to 1,000 subscribers. And I just want to say how grateful I am to all of you. At the risk of sounding cliche or cheesy, um, it really is thanks to all of you that we're at the point that we're at. Uh, we being this channel. Uh, so thank you for just the amazing comments I've gotten over the last nine months. Uh, the amazing support and uh, just sense of community you all have contributed to. Uh, I've just best part about doing this is getting to interact with you guys in whatever way that is and at the end of this video I'll be telling you about new ways you can interact with me so stay tuned to the end to make sure you don't miss out on that um, in addition we are also doing the Q&A today as promised um, I'll be answering all the questions you guys left in one of my previous videos but yeah just again thank you for the big 1k i've uh enjoy doing this every single day it's never really a chore for never really a chore for me so um it's not much else to say really i hope i keep doing this for years to come so without too much blabbing and yapping, I have the questions here. Now, I don't have uh, the names of who com who asked these questions, just because, um, I don't know, if you don't want to be associated with the question, that's fine. Um, there's a fair few. And since I tend to yap, it could take a while. <laughs> so I hope you will relax and put this on in the background while you're doing something, or maybe just watch my ugly face. <laughs> it's up to you. And let's get into these questions. The first question, what were your first steps when starting this channel like do you simply decide what you're going to make and you just do it and stick to it um i get creative itches if you will where a thorn of an idea will stick in my head about something I want to do creatively, whether that be making a video game, uh, trying to do something artistic like painting or pixel art, um, or something web design related. And when one of these creative thorns gets in there, it's just going to keep nagging at me and nagging at me until I like do it in a way that is satisfying to me. So I've mentioned previously that this channel is actually my third attempt at making an ASMR channel. This, this thorn uh, of wanting to have an ASMR channel um, has been there for years. I've always liked the idea of doing it, and I've always wanted to do it. Failed twice before, and I guess in January, I just decided, um, I'm just, I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna do it, and I'm not gonna stop until I get to a point, uh, where I think I've been successful. And once I've gotten to that point, I'm not going to want to stop anyway. So really that's how I started, was just this. I just wanted to. Like, 
I wanted to be part of this community. I wanted to, um, more than that, I wanted to be a creator, not in the cringy content creator title sense. I wanted to be a creator in the, I want to make things from my own head and put them out into the world. Um, and ASMR is the medium, I think, that resonates with me the most. Um, so another part of that question, do you simply decide what you're going to make and do you just stick to it? Um, it takes time. If you're thinking about creating a channel, it takes time to find your rhythm or figure out what your lane is, uh, figure out what your voice is. <laughs> and when starting this, I knew I wanted to be uh, gaming focused. Um, for a variety of reasons, I love video games. I think so certain video games have a very uh, relaxing capacity to them, especially Minecraft. So I knew right away I wanted to be uh, Minecraft focused, or at least that be the springboard for things. Um, and even like from a logistical sense, Minecraft being, I think, the most popular video game of all time, short of Tetris. Um, and it's, uh, making Minecraft content was a no-brainer because I knew millions of people out there know what and can relate to Minecraft. Um, but at the same time, I knew I wanted to have non-gaming content because I enjoy that a lot as well. But the issue was the two times prior that I've tried to make an ASMR channel, I quit mainly because the effort of making the in real life videos compared to the payoff when you're just starting out is small unless you get lucky with the algorithm. So I just burnt myself out really easily. So this time around, uh, and I knew I needed to try gaming and stick to that because it'd be much easier to crank those out since I already game anyway. And yes, I've obviously stuck to that. Next question. From watching you build, I've noticed you're highly critical. Do you ever find that your expectations are too high? And in that, I'd also be interested to know how you might deal with that. Uh, yes. I am very critical. My expectations are always too high. But I'm working on it. And... This is something that actually applies to pretty much anything I do that's creative in nature. Everything from cooking to my web design work, uh, anything artistic, creating videos, building in Minecraft, I all it, it all suffers from the same issue is that if things aren't perfect, I'm not satisfied, and there are ways to deal with this that I'm still learning and getting better at, but I would say the best thing is to ac accept that whatever you do is not going to be perfect and the only metric that really matters in my opinion is growth take any discipline and 
no matter how bad you are at it, if you are better at it today than you were yesterday, then you are on a course. You are on a course to be an expert at it at some point in the future. Growth, right? So that's, I try to keep that in mind for no matter what I'm doing. But another really good tool is this idea that is prevalent in software development and I'm sure in other uh, industries as well. This idea of an MVP or a minimum viable product, which is basically before you start on a project, define to yourself or the stakeholders what the product, what's, what's the minimum the product can be for it to be considered done. Not what's the best version of the product that you can get out there. What is the minimum version of that product? That way you know this is the point you absolutely must reach if you've defined it ahead of time uh, in order to be consider it done. If you don't have that goal, how do you know when you're done? You'll, you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be finished, right? Um, I apologize for the banging outside. I have no idea what's going on out there. Hopefully you can't hear it. But yes, set reasonable expectations for yourself, give yourself grace, and realize if you're better today than you were yesterday, then that's really all that matters. Do you have any recommendations on how to start therapy? Sorry, I just got a text. I know everyone has their preferences, but I've never been able to find my way into it. Yeah, so... I will start off by saying... Sorry, this is probably in the way. I think everyone can benefit from therapy. But unfortunately, we live in a world, especially if you're in the U.S., where therapy is not accessible if you are not well off financially. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a really good, good paying job, and my, well, how I got into therapy. Let's, let's, let's stick with the question here. All I did was go on my uh, health insurance provider's website, uh, you know, go to the type of provider, choose therapy, and then all these results within X amount of miles comes up. You have to consider a few things if you're choosing a therapist. Uh, one is what are they focused on? Is it, uh, uh, you know, behavioral psychology, child psychology, family psychology? Um, make sure whatever you want to seek help for is something this therapist specializes in. I'd say uh, make sure they have a reasonable number of years of experience. Uh, make sure they have experience dealing with what you want to deal with, obviously. Um, make sure there's someone you think you can be comfortable with. Usually, therapist listings will have a short bio about the therapist so that you know who they are, in a sense, and you can kind of get an idea of if you think you're a good match with them. Obviously, you don't want to choose a therapist that you'll be intimidated by or not feel comfortable with or who possesses some f physical characteristics that are traumatic for you. I, whatever it is, uh, you know, make sure you think it's someone that you can kind of mesh with. 
and then I'll also say, um, you're not married to your therapist. If it's not working out, you can stop going and you can find someone else, right? Um, but again, if you're not financially secure, it can be a tricky thing to get, to get into. Um, fortunately, my healthcare plan is such that, you know, after a few months at the beginning of the year, I've pretty much met my deductible and I don't have to pay for anything for the rest of the year. Well, I have to pay like a little bit, but, um, but I know if you don't have good health insurance or if you're in like the UK where there's huge waiting lists and things like that, it's not always easy to get into and I recognize that, but I would, I would say almost everybody can benefit from therapy, even if it's just a few sessions. If you would give any life advice to someone, what would it be? So I had a bit of a think about this before I started recording, just so I didn't not know what to say. Um, I have two parts to this. The first one is kind of double-sided. It is always own up to your mistakes and also always admit what you don't know. And these are two things I find uh, incredibly attractive, not in like a romantic sense necessarily, in just a human being sense. And these are these are attractive qualities because they require a degree of self-awareness and humility that many people don't have. <laughs> if you make a mistake, own up to it, recognize you made a mistake, admit to it if you need to admit to someone, and then figure out mentally or maybe even make a plan about how you cannot make that mistake again and then move on. The mistake is done, it's happened. The worst thing you can do is try to run from your mistakes mentally. Try to justify them. And I will tell you, if you're not, if you are living with guilt, your life will continue to go downhill until you reach rock bottom where the guilt will need to be addressed and it might not be in a very pretty way. What was I saying before that? <laughs> um, yeah, the worst thing you can do is to, is to try to pretend like you didn't make the mistake, to give justification, to make excuses. All these things, if you're not a psychopath, that is, will lead to you having unresolved and conflicted emotions that will only hurt you and others. And we all want to be better people, don't we? The best way to become a better person is to learn from your mistakes and from the mistakes of others. And then the other part of this, admit what you don't know. This is something that drives me crazy in, uh, at work, in a professional setting most of all, but also just in, you know, relationships. People who try to cover up the fact that they don't know everything. In my mind, a sign of great intelligence and wisdom is the readiness to say, hey, I don't know what that is, or like in a professional setting, it, just to say like, um, I don't know what we're talking about, or I don't understand this subject, can you explain it? Like that, rather than me viewing that person as being dumb, I immediately view that person as being very smart because they understand and recognize they don't know something and they want to know it. 
If you don't admit that you don't know something, you might as well just say, I don't want to know what that is. And the second part of this life advice is not really related, but it's that change is best accomplished in small steps. If you haven't read the book uh, Atomic Habits, I'd highly recommend it. It's one of those kind of hipster you life uh, life advice books about how you can get control of your life and make changes you want to make in easy ways and the easiest way to make a change in yourself or in something you're doing is to map out very small or reasonable steps you can take to get there you know if if you're trying to lose weight and you're gonna diet almost all diets fail because of a lack of discipline and the lack of discipline is not necessarily the fault of whoever is trying to diet it could be that they it's probably that they tried to make too dramatic of changes too quickly. We all have inertia, this tendency to continue to do what we're doing. And to change that requires a lot of energy, uh, mentally most of all, but probably physically as well. And to go from eating junk food all day every day to eating nothing but celery, you can't do that. You just cannot do that unless you have tremendous willpower. You're just not going to want to stick with that. The real way to do that, if dieting is our example here, uh, start by swapping out your fast food order with something a little healthier on the menu. And then once you're okay with that, try maybe a healthier place to eat. Once you're okay with that, try cooking something simple that's healthier. I think you get the idea. What is your earliest memory of ASMR? Um, discovering it slash any ASMR in your life before you knew what it was. So I actually said this in a previous video, but if you didn't watch that, I'll uh, go over this again. The I've had ASMR experiences my whole life, long before I knew what ASMR was, and the earliest memory of that was just sitting with friends on my floor in my room as a kid playing Legos. Something about the tactility of Legos the noises they make, and seeing people intensely focus on something, it, that's like a, it's like a triple whammy for me. I would just get crazy ASMR whenever I had friends over, uh, and we'd play Legos. So that was my earliest experience, I think. And then I discovered in college through a friend that it was a real, actual thing. Um, and that there were whole, whole sections, a whole section of YouTube devoted to this thing that I always knew I could experience but never thought I would talk about it with anyone because it seemed weird so it's just kind of crazy that uh, I found out about this through a friend and I'm glad I did and I think ASMR has really become a hugely popular thing uh, today uh, it, well I won't get into that <laughs> next question how do you balance your YouTuber life and personal life? Is there any struggles at all? Uh, not really. 
I don't, like I said before, I don't really consider myself a YouTuber. In my mind, that would be like if YouTube was my main source of income or like my main focus in life. YouTube for me is obviously a hobby. And the biggest thing that drives me to do it is first and foremost, well, I guess, okay, the, the biggest rewards I get from ASMR, first and foremost, when someone tells me I've helped them either to relax or sleep or to, or something I've talked about really resonated with them. Man, I can ride that high all day. Like, knowing I've helped someone is fantastic. And then second, just the community of... Just the tightness of the ASMR community, and this channel especially, is really another thing that keeps me going. So balancing that, um, it doesn't really take a ton of time out of my day, to be honest. Uh... Uh, like the actual recording and editing I've gotten down to a science where it doesn't take a ton of time for me what does take a ton of time uh, are two things if I do an in real life video setting up my living room or my kitchen or whatever takes a lot of time um, and then like back in the better minecraft series some of the more elaborate builds took hours and hours to plan uh so but i really don't have a life <laughs> so it's not really that hard to balance the two um obviously personal and like relational commitments always come first for me but I do always get this nag if I've gone a couple days without posting that like I really need to get back on it and not like a chore like I, I genuinely want to so I reach I'd say to answer your question I've reached this nice medium where it's been integrated into my life in a way that's not stressful for me uh, one thing subscribers don't know about I thought for a long time about this. There's really not that many interesting things about me, I'm sorry to say. The only answer I could come up with was I've been to a lot of countries. Uh, like, the majority of Europe I've been to, um, as well as Mexico and Canada. I'm going to Portugal this, in like a month or so. So I guess that's interesting, and you guys probably didn't know that. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty well-traveled, and that's all due to the fact of having wealthy parents growing up. Like, that's, that's, that's none of my doing. I can't really, like, I'm not going to sit here and brag and be like, oh, I've, I've been to all these countries. Like, no, I just had really well-off childhood, and I'm really grateful for that. Where do you see your channel in five years? So, nothing against this question, but I, I dislike when I get questions like these, especially like annual reviews at work. I'm, they almost always ask you this, where do you see yourself in five years? And I don't think that far ahead. I genuinely don't. I ride this wave that we call life and I try to make the best of it and in a general sense I have a goal of where I'd like to head like starting off in my career I very quickly learned that web design and especially UI UX was the path I wanted to take but I didn't I don't I don't know where I'll be in five years and especially since we are in a time of cultural and technological history where things are changing so quickly and so regularly it's almost impossible to predict anything 
So where do I think the channel's gonna be in five years? I can tell you where I don't want it to be. I don't want to be one of those YouTubers who sells out, and I'm not even thinking of anybody in particular, but I just know there's this trend toward making con only content that does well. And if YouTube is your career, that's fine. Do where the money leads you. But I don't want this channel to be something that's just numbers focused. I want it to always be a creative endeavor. And I also never want to lose touch with my audience. If I'm doing something wrong or doing something you guys don't enjoy, I want to constantly be shifting and staying with what you guys want to see, which is, I guess, where you where I want the channel to be in five years is exactly where I think it is now, where I involve you guys in pretty much everything I'm doing and thinking about to get your input on it. Um, and I just hope I never go the way of clickbait or selling out to dumb sponsorships or anything like that. Any non-YouTube hobbies. <laughs> Yes, believe it or not. Um, again, I'm not a super interesting person, but a huge, huge, huge hobby for me is cooking, which you've probably picked up on a little bit in my videos, but the kitchen is my happy place. Um, I spend at least two hours there every day, and I'm really grateful that Look, okay, I'm not grateful COVID happened, obviously, but the shift that allowed me to now work remotely almost every day of the week means me and I know a lot of other people now have so much more time to do things that you actually want to do rather than all that wasted time commuting, commuting to and from an office and all the rigmarole. Uh, before COVID, cooking for me was much more abbreviated, and I had to, th if I wanted to relax in evenings, I had to really cut down my cooking time, but now I'm grateful that I've reached a work-life balance where I can, like, spend two hours cooking dinner almost every day, and to me, that's one of my therapies throwing on a podcast or an audiobook and just cooking it's where I'm most happy another hobby and another therapy for me is running I run almost every day and it not only helps my mental health um, it obviously keeps me fit um, makes pretty much every aspect of my life better and running is almost like a meditation because once you get to your stride you can kind of tune out your body and let it go on autopilot and you can just kind of contemplate life you know I also do a lot of artistic endeavors these are more uh they kind of come in waves, like I said at the beginning, where I just get this urge to do something. Uh, I've, you know, like I've done a lot of digital painting, I've done pixel art, I make video games sometimes, and then now obviously YouTube. And then obviously video games, but that was apparent. <laughs> what's your, what's your age, height, and bicep measurement? Well, I don't have a way to measure my biceps, but I can tell you I'm not ripped. <laughs> I'm not a very strong person. I focus much more on cardio than I do lifting weights. Uh, my age is 29. My height is 6 foot. What is your favorite artist and favorite song by them? I couldn't narrow it down to just one. Uh, it really, my favorite changes like on a daily basis. So I'll give you three artists that have been 
cornerstones of my listening. The first is Oh Wonder, is the artist. And if I had to choose one song, I'd say Magnificent. The next is Rami, R-O-M-Y. And if I had to choose a song, it'd be Weightless. And then last, Mariana's Trench. And I couldn't pick one song, but just go listen to their latest album. It's fantastic. How did you get your start with Minecraft, and did you believe in Herobrine? I heard about Minecraft back when it was an alpha, and it was one of those things like not really many people heard about or knew about. And I heard about it through a friend when I was in high school, and I started playing it, and this was just when it was the ball was starting to roll of its coming popularity um so i started playing it and i'd never really played anything like that ever before and i didn't really get it at first i had fun with it for like a couple weeks and then i was just kind of like i don't really understand what the hype is but then a youtuber named paul soares jr came onto my radar and the way he played opened my eyes to what the game is or could be and so I really got into it and I actually started playing a week before the nether update came out which was a Halloween uh, and did I believe in Herobrine? No because I was older than probably most of you watching <laughs> Uh, well, I, I can't say that. I think my average viewership is like 22 or 21. So being in high school, obviously didn't believe in that. And to be honest, I'm kind of an oblivious person. <laughs> like, I don't pay attention to hype or trends much, and especially not in high school. So I didn't really know what Herobrine even was until like years later, to be honest. Um, what would you do if you won the lottery? It really depends on how much the lottery was worth. Let's assume a couple million or something. I would... Well, I'm already debt-free, but I would definitely buy a house. But it would be a modest house. One that doesn't attract too much attention. Um, but something I can just pay off and own and not have to worry about. I'd invest a lot of it. And then I'd also, as cliche as it sounds, give a lot of it away to charities or whatever. Um, pay off all my friends' uh, schooling debt. But I wouldn't want to hold on to it, a lot of it. It would be too much pressure and stress trying to figure out what to do with all that money I would just keep enough to you know, buy a house invest a lot of it and then just get rid of the rest of it in an intelligent way Would you go into space if you had the chance? No What's your earliest memory? It's funny, I Actually, I'm not going to talk about that. It kind of dabbles on... It kind of teeters on the edge of spiritual stuff, so I'm not going to... Earliest real actual memory... I think I must have been two or three... Uh, standing next to my mom in an ice cream shop that our friends owned at the time. And being handed you know those like w tiny little wooden spoons they used to give out samples of ice cream I remember having one of those I can like still taste like that that wood taste of that of that spoon um, I think that's the earliest I can remember what do you think the most overused UX or UI tr trend is So to anybody who doesn't know, 
UX UI is user experience and user interfaces. Um, and I, I'm going to broaden this question to be just web design in general. I can't think of just one, but things that bother me. The advent of tools like Squarespace and uh, what's the other popular one? Word? Words? No. Well, these easy to use website creation tools where you just kind of pick a template and you can be set up in like five minutes. They aren't bad in themselves, but they've led their popularity has led to a homogenation of the internet where everything looks identical. Every website pretty much has the same layout. All the buttons are in the same space, same place. All the same color trends and color palettes, and there's no personality anywhere. We are no longer in the wild west of the internet. We are now in this homogenous corporate cesspool. <laughs> and I'm guilty of this too, because it's what stakeholders or people I design for want. So I don't get a choice, really. I just regret that this is the way things are. And then another, like, really, something that really bothers me is the, and this was much more widespread, I think, like, eight or ten years ago, but this cartoonish, uh, like, these cartoonish people that all these websites use or did use to show that, like, they're customer-focused or whatever, all these people would be like, really cartoonish looking and misproportioned and like the whole corporate Memphis thing. I can't stand it. What was your favorite childhood game? This depends on what part of my childhood you're asking about. And if you mean video games or board games or something else, I'll assume video game. The first one that was really important to me uh, was Star Wars Battlefront 2 and RuneScape, both those around the same time. I played the heck out of those, and as embarrassing as it is, <laughs> I actually still play RuneScape, which is now called Old School RuneScape, uh, something I kind of just mindlessly do at times. Uh, I don't like I'm. Yeah, I won't get into that. But and then also, after that period, the game Gary's Mod was a big part of my childhood. I actually made a couple of really close internet friends when I was like in middle school uh, through Gary's Mod. Unfortunately, I'm not in contact with them anymore. But yeah. To what place in the world would you like to travel one day? I have two places. First is Japan. Always been so intrigued by the culture, uh, how clean and how clean everything is, how polite and respectful everybody seems to be. Which I'm, I know there's probably exceptions in every case, but and then. <laughs> Another weird thing is, I have this really weird fascination with the like all the different kinds of vending machines over there and in other like Asian countries. I just find them so interesting for some reason. And then the other one is uh, Iceland, actually. And I've been to Iceland, but we were only there for like 24 hours on a layover. And I was young and also really sleep deprived, so I barely remember it. But from what I've seen of pictures, Iceland looks like just some of the most stunning scenery anywhere on the planet. 
are you planning to do a Discord one day? So this, I've thought a lot about this, and I've gone back and forth. I would say probably in the future, I will. Um, but what I don't like, I don't like when things are about me. Like, it feels, and I know you guys probably don't see it this way, but t to have a Discord revolving around me just because I made this channel seems a little kind of strange and uncomfortable. And then also, the, like, selfish reasons, like, it's just a lot of work um, to maintain. I don't want to moderate. Uh, and then, yeah, but there's a caveat to that, which I'll say at the end. The last question. Do you have any hidden talents? <laughs> now, I would say no, because in my mind, a talent is like something you're naturally good at. And I can't really think of anything like that except maybe cooking. But everything else, like I've had to work hard to, I've had to work hard to get good at. So a silly answer, <laughs> I'm like kind of ridiculously good at drums on Rock Band, like the game Rock Band. I can play drums. Anyway, that's all the questions. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Now this video is getting long, so the last piece of news I have is that the Patreon Minecraft server is going live very soon, maybe even by the time this video is up. Um, so if you subscribe or pay on Patreon, you can join the Minecraft server, which is going to be called Arcadia Craft. And on top of that, there, well, a few friends are helping me host and set it up. And one of them is also a YouTuber, Baked Gaming. Go subscribe to her. And there's a chance there may be other YouTubers, like not many, but involved in the future uh, on an invite basis only. But the goal of this server is to have it long lasting uh, not something that resets every three months or whatever, but like long lasting. If we do reset it, it will be by popular vote. And to keep it a close, tight knit community where I can actually get to know you guys and actually play with you guys, not just like set up a server, set you loose on it, and then like never log in again. Like, I actually want to play with you guys. So, me and a few friends are in the process, as I'm recording this, of setting it up. It could be available by the time this video is up. Check the description. Uh, but if you pay on Patreon, you'll get access to the server. And then this brings me to my point about Discord. There is a Discord for the server. So, if you pay to be on the server, you will also gain access to the Discord, obviously. There's a chance I will open that Discord, not the server, but the Discord up to everybody in the future. I just don't like public Discords because people come and go so often and it's so unrestricted and unvetted. That's not the kind of community I like. So that's how things stand right now. I need to wrap this video up because it's ridiculously long. Um, yeah, thank you again for 1,000 subscribers, new server, Minecraft Patreon server coming, I probably will make a separate video talking all about that, uh, but it might also be live now, so check the description. Thank you for watching, I hope you found this relaxing and enjoyable, and I'll see you next time.